Ok, vamos então começar. Uh, vou introduzir o Emanuel Leonardo que vai fazer uma apresentação com o título. The Anthropocene as a Regime of Visibility. Então, Emanuel Leonardo was born in Parma, Italy, on July 29, 1981. Wow! <laughs> yes. His PhD in Theory and Criticism was granted by the University of Western Ontario in Canada. Before working at SESH, he has been postdoc fellow at the University of Bergamo. His research interests include political ecology, working class environmentalism, climate change policy, and its critique, biopolitics, and social movement analysis. Uh, he's a member of TROFO. His most recent publications include Greening Class Analysis Back In, Assessing the Transformation of the Value Nature Nexus to Strengthen the Connection Between the Growth and Environmental Justice, published last year in Ecological Economics, as well as Working Class Ecology and Union Politics, Conceptual Topology, co-authored <coughs> with Stefania Barca, and published in Globalizations in 2018. Thank you very much, and please invite me more often because that's a huge boost to my self-esteem. So, and you know, I, apart from this, uh, thank you, Antonio, and thank you, Vera, for putting together a, a seminar, this workshop. You know, it's, it's great to uh, have a moment of uh, discussion uh, right now. Yeah, midway through. Um, <coughs> trouble. So basically, um, this presentation is a revision of uh, an introduction I had to write for a... Um, we translated with um, a colleague of mine, Alessandro Barbero, the two articles by Jason Moore on uh, Anthropocene or Capitalocene into Italian today, two, two years ago. And we had this uh, problem while writing the introduction that the Anthropocene debate in Italy was non-existent at the time. So we had to actually write uh, as an introduction that you know, two thirds of the introduction are devoted to just reporting what had uh, happened uh, in the debate, and then we went on uh, to uh, you know try to write uh, about our uh, our own take on the on the debate. And you see, like you know, the, the, the subtitle is actually what counts the most: climate change and labor transformation. So our uh, to make a long sh a story short, the, the main argument is that. Precisely because climate change and labor issues interact in a certain way, then the Anthropocene opens up a space of visibility in which that crisis can be seen as manageable and can be called the uh, Anthropocene. Uh, so the outline, very quickly. I won't spend much time on the definition part. I will spend a little bit of time on the origin part. part. When does the Anthropocene begin? Because I realized that uh, we haven't been talking about that uh, yet. And then uh, I will uh, finish and devote a little bit more time to this idea of, uh, of visibility, under what conditions our climate change defined contemporary appears as uh, Anthropocene. Because the, the, the weird part is that all the data about climate change and um, its impacts on uh, human societies, uh, country societies more specifically, <coughs> was available already in the 60s and in the 70s. But then we started to talk about that at the end of the 80s. So like, you know, there was a little bit like, my question is, why did the debate uh, go back to the end of the 80s and not before? Okay, that was uh, somehow <coughs> what interested us. The definition, I will go very quickly because I think it was all implicit in Stefania's uh, presentation. We have uh, two uh, different kinds of this debate. The one is, if you want, the scientific or geological debate, which is, in my opinion, kind of reasonable. Like, you know, there, is, uh, there are anthropic impacts on uh, uh, components and functions of the Earth system, uh, and that's kind of a novelty, before the 20th century that wasn't really the case, or at least not in that uh, deep uh, way. So we have a little bit of geologists dealing with this, and there, is, there isn't really any problem with that per se. But slightly and uh, in a not very clear way, this geological Anthropocene immediately turns into the Anthropocene as a style of, govern uh, of governance, which is precisely what Stefania was talking about. So I don't want to um, uh, lose time um, discussing this. I think if you want, in order to make, a, uh, to take something interesting out of the debate on the Anthropocene, you have two ways and they can go together. The one way is to politicize the um, 
the issue, and if you want, you can use Wingedal to do that. And the other one is to focus on how the Anthropocene masks the issue of inequality in its various <coughs> dimensions, and of course, the work of Stefania Barca is the, the way to go, at least in my opinion. Then there is a, um, a good part of the debate on the Anthropocene has been uh, dealing with uh, wh when should we uh, make the Anthropocene uh, begin. Because as uh, Maria Enrica um, has proposed, and I agree with her, every foundational myth when it comes to the Anthropocene actually requires that there is a non-innocent, like, you know, very uh, situated uh, interaction between human species, global environment, and the capitalist mode of production. You will see that at, um, at the bottom of this uh, slide, I have uh, added uh, the state form, because, as you can see in this second slide, the first foundational uh, myth we have, which is in terms of uh, the date shared by Timothy Morton and uh, Jim Scott, uh, dates back uh, at, the, or at the beginning of uh, the agriculture as a practice, and so, well, we don't have the capitalist mode of production back then. So in that case, it's human species, global environment, and either state form or uh, agriculture. But then uh, Timothy Morton talks about agrologistics. He says, basically, as soon as humanity started to look at its surrounding environment in a way that had to be domesticated, then we have the beginning of the Anthropocene. So it's not really about the addition of carbon dioxide or other stuff like that. Like those that are interesting, but the point is that, epistemologically speaking, <coughs> it is the starting point. Of, like, as soon as we manipulate the fire, and we did with that agriculture, we started the Anthropocene, and it was just a matter of time that we arrived where we uh, arrived. <coughs> Jim Scott makes, in my opinion, a, a more uh, understandable point, although I don't agree much with him, and he says, no, it's not really agriculture, it's the state form, so like in a form of social uh, organization that actually happens to be um, uh, uh, emerging at the same time, that makes agriculture what it is, and not agriculture that makes the state form. Um, so, this is the first foundational myth. The second foundational myth, uh, myth um, and as uh, these authors uh, have been proposed, like, you know, because every foundation of it has a plurality of proposals. Mm -hmm. so, uh, Martin and Lewis, for example, proposed the year, a very specific year, uh, 1610, um, and in that case the focus is on uh, colonization, because this year is important because it comes after the so-called Colombian uh, exchange, so the, the discovery of the new world and the first globalization of food, and basically, it's very smart what they do, because this year is when the effect of uh, genocide, so the reduction of population from 60 million more or less to 6 million more or less, implied a huge process of reforestation, which meant carbon dioxide absorption. So this 1610 is the year in which carbon dioxide was lowest in the planet, because of course, fire and people weren't around in that very important part uh, of the world, which is uh, the Americas, and they call it the, Orb, uh, the Orbis Spy. And more or less, in terms of uh, date and historical period, it is um, consistent with uh, the Don Haraway and Jason Moore idea of Capitalocene until the 2016, and then, of course, Haraway progresses and talks about the Tulusine, but that is much more a, a, a political category rather than uh, a historical category when history comes to play a role. Uh, uh, she says both in the interviews and in the last book that he is okay with the capitalist critique of the Anthropocene. What he says, what she says, is that politically we have to add something because if not we run risks. And I, I follow her in this. But when it comes to the origin uh, issue, we are here. Then the third option is uh, the one proposed by Crutzen, who actually coined the term uh, in the early 2000s, or better, he actually reproposed a concept the concept of Anthropocene, which had been coined in the 80s by Sturmer in the 2000s, and in that context it got popularized and became a, a big thing, as we know right now, whereas in the 80s it was uh, a little bit too, too early, and he basically says, like, you know, I think 
the starting point of the, of the Anthropocene should be the first industrial revolution. So he has a, a 1784, so the last um, prototype of the steam engine. Whereas uh, Ormond uh, and Malm focusing on fossil capital, capitalism would say it's much more about the second industrial revolution, so mid uh, 18th century with the shift uh, to fossil fuels uh, as main um, energy providers for uh, capitalist accumulation. But in any case, the beginning of capitalism in terms of uh, its relationship with energy is what this third uh, option uh, highlights. The fourth uh, option is the, the so called uh, Great Acceleration and actually, actually focuses on uh, the second half of the 20th century, so post uh, World War II uh, world. In this case, what they focus on is uh, the co presence of two important elements, three actually. One is the Fordist mode of production, so let's say not only industrialization, but the fact that through mass consumption, industrialization had to account for <coughs> growing, um, for growing needs of working class in, classes in the West being included in the social mechanism. The second issue is um, quick urbanization. And the third one is the paradigm of uh, development. So we, we shouldn't forget that on the one hand we have uh, a social pact in the global north between classes, but this pact is predicated on the fact that we have something like a neo-colonizing uh, logic according to which the US are the apex of social evolution and all the other countries should like, follow uh, its steps. So we understand properly this great acceleration if we, fo if we situate it in between New Deal and Marshall Planning in the Western in US and Europe and the Truman Doctrine uh, when it comes to international uh, relations. All of them, in my opinion, well, to be honest, the first one I I totally disagree, but whatever, like, you know, it's still uh, <coughs> when it comes to Scott's uh, hypothesis, a reasonable one that should be taken into account. I think that all three options have um, positive sides uh, and some uh, shortcomings. But what, I, what we wanted to focus on in terms of our own contribution to the debate was actually to understand why none None of these options focused on the issue, but when did we start to see the situation as something like uh, the Anthropocene? And I was inspired in posing this question by the work of Mackenzie Ward in a book called uh, Molecular Red, when he actually basically says that the Anthropocene is a battlefield upon which a new labor perspective on the historical task of the future of our time can be posed. And again, he goes on saying, the Anthropocene is a brilliant act that introduces the point of view of labor in its largest meaning into, of course, this is geology, and geology is a title uh, from the Italian uh, slide. So the question is, what did change in labor as a practice? And I share um, the focus Stefania proposed before on the issue of labor, although uh, it's clearly a problematic category. What happened? so that uh, we can see uh, the Anthropocene as a geological epoch and a style uh, of, um, of governance. Again, another source I used is uh, Chakrabarti, uh, who says, that, you know, notwithstanding when the term emerged, <coughs> the key years are the end uh, of the 80s. And I think it's a... Uh, it's correct, like you know, it basically says Anthropocene is another name for climate mitigation. So the idea that carbon dioxide emissions could be lower all while maintaining the rate of profit increasing. This idea which I think uh, can be best uh, captured by the notion of uh, the green economy, the idea that the environmental limit, limit can be internalized not as an obstacle to development to capitalist accumulation, but as a driver of capitalist accumulation, is actually a very weird idea. Because when the, the, the ecological crisis became a fully political issue, 
and we are talking about that uh, cycle of struggle which is in between 1968 and the first oil shock in 1973. I don't have time to uh, analyze this uh, cycle of struggle. Let me just say that I share with Stefania the idea that what made this wave of struggle unique in the history of workers' movement uh, struggles is the relevance of social reproduction and uh, its actors in this movement. So that you, know, you don't understand the way of uh, the way of uh, health and safety uh, struggles in the workplace without taking into account feminism. Okay, like, you know, the fact that social reproduction was uh, assuming a, a role it never had before, even allowed struggles within the workplace or within production to be more effective, more, more imaginative, and stuff, uh, and um, all this. When this happened, the idea that Capital, capital, capitalism could flourish by taking into account the environmental crisis was absolutely unthinkable. Okay? The idea was capitalist elite discussing adaptation in the mid 70s when climate change became a, a, a legitimate issue in um, government discussion and stuff like that. By the way, first in the Soviet Union and oh wow, and just, uh, <laughs> in, uh, in the US. The idea was, okay, we have the Cold War uh, to win, okay, extinction uh, may be an option, okay, like, you know, it's much better to get extinct than to lose the Cold War, <laughs> so let's go on and we'll adapt. So all the scientists and policy makers were, you know, trying to think, you know, but how do we adapt to this? The idea of mitigation wasn't there, okay, it arrives at the end of the 80s because this weird idea of the green economy, uh, so you can keep together climate mitigation and uh, profits emerge. Under which condition you can think about green economy, which means managing climate through mitigation, which means uh, the Anthropocene, at least in my uh, reading, because of three uh, in intermingling uh, elements, which have to do with the fact that the, the cycle of struggle I was talking about before uh, actually underwent a peculiar defeat. So, all the objectives that mark this cycle of struggles were not achieved. So we are still obviously in a capitalist world in which you know, exploitation is the rule uh, and like, the value form exercises its power and uh, we all agree about that. But the basis for accumulation has significantly changed, at least uh, uh, in my opinion. And so these three elements are the so-called becoming productive of the sphere of reproduction, which is no longer to be considered by capitalists. Right? I mean, infinite and gratuitous and it's uh, because this is um, the formula David Ricardo used. So in classical political economy you have the sphere of reproduction, like the environment, domestic labor, the labor works because it is considered infinite and free. You can easily dispose of it infinitely and gratuitously as Ricardo said. This uh, particular first uh, aspect which is in my opinion the most important one is uh, investigated in a in a way I totally agree with, by Catherine Wolby and uh, Melinda Cooper in a book called um, Clinical Labor, uh, which I think is very good. The second uh, element is a progressive cognitization of uh, labor, which means that right now, especially green commodities have a key component of uh, information. So when uh, Antonio was talking about carbon markets, the kind of commodities you exchange on those markets are not nature as in the tree. But nature <laughs> has the sinking potential of the tree, the tree, which is calculated in a certain way to conform to financial instruments. Mm -hmm. And here we go to the third uh, element, which is neoliberal uh, financialization, and then I got a, a, a mistake uh, in Italian sentence, which is useful mm -hmm. later on. So I'm going to conclude by saying that in this uh, uh, article uh, for uh, South Atlantic Quarterly, uh, Matteo Pasquinelli makes the case for integrating the energetic labor theory of value, which is key to grasp fossil capitalism, and which is like, you know, if you want, uh, the way classical political economy looked at the sphere of reproduction, with the informational labor theory of value, uh, which actually gives us a possibility to read, in terms of the critical political economy, new markets. The, the ones in which the sphere of production is no longer infinite and free, but still producing surplus value, 
and, um, and nature also is not considered uh, that way. This has uh, not just uh, analytical advantages because it allows us to read, uh, in my opinion, in the proper way, uh, the recent markets, but it has a political advantage of trying to create a convergence between those movements who have been uh, involved in the critique of digital capitalism with those movements which have been involved in the critique of uh, ecological, uh, ecological <coughs> catastrophic uh, capitalism. And I think we do need uh, this convergence to, to happen. If I have two minutes, uh, I will just go to this conclusion because mm, on this I may be uh, a little bit uh, disagreeing with Stefania. I see the uh, narrative of uh, the Anthropocene as being in a deep crisis right now. Uh, I don't know, maybe I misunderstood your point, but it seems like uh, uh, if in 2012 this uh, particular way of uh, looking at the interaction between nature and capitalism was basically the only game in town, I think that what happened uh, at COP uh, conference of the party number 24 uh, last December has changed the game radically. Like, you know, it, not only this is no longer the only game in town, but it's actually the weakest game in town. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, the cracks, you can see, uh, are twofold, and both internal. The first one is the emergence uh, of uh, a denialist uh, front, which is explicitly defining itself as denialist within the COP system. Right? So if you want like, the, the, the list you made, it would have been impossible in 2015 in Paris to have Trump with Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait saying, no, the IPCC is not providing us with the basis for negotiations. Okay, you know, we will take into account the IPCC report. We are not welcoming the IPCC report, which, if we want to be uh, rigorous in the analysis, is exactly the end of the framework convention on climate change as the UN envisaged it. Because in 92, when the convention was created, and in 94, when it started, uh, in 95, when the COP system started, it started on the basis of the non-negotiability of the IPCC report. Okay? In any case, the second point, uh, the second crack is, I, I write Greta Thunberg here, but just to say, you know, big environmental NGOs, which have provided, cons like, you know, consensus-wise, a, a certain solidity to the COP system, because the idea was, it's not enough, but it's the, right, first, it's the first step in the right direction. Okay. You read, uh, for example, Greenpeace or, or WWF comments after every single COP, it's a copy and paste. Like, oh, we need to do much more, but it's better than nothing. This is no longer what they do, because after 25 years of implementation, these green economy policies don't work. So like, basically, you have the, the, um, the bet was profit up, emission down. What we have is profit up, emission up. So after a while, like you know, right now there is a historical record, and even these big NGOs are withdrawing their uh, uh, social support, which is basically tapping into the spread of uh, global activism. Because right now we have, like you know, radical climate justice, which has always been skeptical towards the COP system, joining forces or at least trying to join forces with this uh, previously active uh, in the COP system uh, part of activism. Competition is always possible, but the room for maneuvering has uh, shine. So what I'm trying to say is that I see, as, uh, I think, a new phase of the Anthropocene debate has actually started in at the end of 2018, and this uh, ecologist 2019 is the beginning of, uh, of something that we should, uh, we will have to conceptualize uh, differently than uh, it was the case uh, before. Thank you. Emanuele. I'm going to introduce um, Irene Velicu. Um, Starting with my birth. <laughs> 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 yeah, the is so Irina is a political scientist working on social environmental conflicts in post-communist countries at the Center for Social Studies. Uh, she holds a PhD in political science from the University of Hawaii in the U.S. side and an MA in international studies from the University of Warwick in the U.K. Her research focuses on three interrelated themes, social, environmental, and food justice uh, movements, and social political transformations, and post-communist studies. 
A recent publications can be found in Theory, Culture and Society, Geoform, New Political Science, Globalizations and Studies in Social Justice. She is the principal investigator of Just Food, from Alternative Food Networks to Environmental Justice. And the title of the presentation is From Peasants to Urban Workers and Back, Debating Agroecology and Social Environmental Justice in Romania. Okay, uh, I have probably the, the most uh, strangest, uh, the strangest title, and I, now I just want to create a little bit of a disruption here, and I was wondering how do you think that this topic of peasants, let's say, can be discussed in connection with Anthropocene, because I've been like, kind of thinking, and I think I found a solution, but I'm just curious about you, who are here probably, because you're curious about this topic, uh, uh, how would you connect? Like, what do you see the connection between Anthropocene and peasant movement? Let's say. I'm just curious. Whoever wants to say something, if, if any. <laughs> okay. Yes. I, please. I see the peasant uh, movement as parts of the process of reproduction <coughs> because they are they are, they practice a form of production that is. Uh, um, subsistence oriented, non-capitalist, non or at least uh, they strive for autonomy from capital, so to me they produce life and uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Any other perspective? I think before before the climate justice movement, the, the peasant movement at the international level was the climate justice movement. Uh, I mean, Via Campesina was one of the leaders internationally of entering uh, uh, into a, a, a critique of capitalism and the ecological crisis before it became a global phenomenon recently. So I think that uh, uh, because of that connection with the land and with, uh, with life, let's say, I would say that, uh, as Stefani noted, uh, I think they are a key uh, social force also in the critique of the, of the capitalism and the uh, all the forms of, of destruction of the, that the Anthropocene manifests. Well, yes, please. I think that um, peasants, but not only peasants, but peasants have po posed a big question mark in this question we were, we've been talking these days of, about the we of the Anthropocene, like mm -hmm. the we. Mm -hmm. uh, responsible for this climate crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, we, when we think peasants, we say, what we in terms of responsibility, because peasant, the peasants in their practices are fighting climate, uh, cri uh, climate crisis for a long time. <coughs> so they are not responsible for for what we are facing. So yeah, I think it's important to consider that. No, tudo bem que eu falo em português, no meu comentário, mas eu acho que quando a gente fala também dos camponeses, pelo menos nas áreas que eu pesquisei, é agricultura familiar, pelo tanto a percepção também tem que ser diferente, porque eles estão também muito perto dessas discussões sobre as mudanças climáticas e também uma preocupação dentro da agricultura familiar, pelo menos nos agrotóxicos, porque temos que resistir, não resistir nos agrotóxicos, e pelo tanto eu acho que também deveria ser diferenciado quando a gente fala de camponeses, de que camponeses estamos falando e como eles constroem a relação com a terra e, e com, também com o uso dos agrotóxicos. I, I can go now. Yes. So we already have a <laughs> presentation. <laughs> it's uh, more or less kind of like what I was thinking about. Um, um, I mean, this is just like a work in progress of the project that I, I started recently, and uh, I don't want to get into the details of the project, but one of the, let's say, case studies is precisely this uh, organization in, in Romania that is part that became part of uh, Via Campesina International uh, recently, in 2010, I think. Um, and uh, which is kind of a novelty for, for Romania uh, and for, uh, for, let's say, the environmental movements in Romania that are quite 
uh, strong, um, and one of the reasons why they became stronger, I would say, including environmental NGOs, uh, so I'm not just saying like movement broadly, but NGOs became stronger also in a context in which they created these um, alliances with um, um, with peasants or with the inhabitants of rural areas because they are not, they are main, many times they are semi-rural or urban, semi-urban. Uh, and so these this movements, let's say, that have been emerging in Romania in the last um, 15 years uh, have been very much uh, grassroots uh, animated by struggles of uh, these inhabitants of rural areas uh, to oppose uh, either mining or fracking or um, um, this uh, agro-business kind of uh, land grabbing phenomenon that is happening a lot in Eastern Europe and not only. So when I was um, thinking about this topic, I was thinking uh, about these people who probably you already know, like these are the struggles that happened recently in Romania, opposing fracking and, um, and um, there was a, a lot of, uh, let's say, um, discussion of social justice and environmental justice because of these conflicts. So it started in the con in the context of conflict. It didn't start in the context of let's say formalized or or uh, academic or intellectual or scientific debate about what to do. It started precisely because of conflicts, and for me this is important. Um, and uh, this is how I realized that yeah, I can connect with the Anthropocene, although it's not my topic, and I'm not going to write about the Anthropocene except for you <laughs> here now. But uh, um, it, it is. It is my way, and probably, as I heard you speaking, your also vision on how to um, repoliticize, let's say, uh, the politics of Anthropocene by looking at these uh, forces of reproduc reproduction of life. Um, of course, this could be. This is the the the, the, the starting point. Um, you realize that um, the Anthropocene, or or in general, the debate on on environmental, let's say, recovery can, can be easily co-opted into a scientific uh, and techno-scientific management. Uh, you realize that this is very insidiously happening precisely because it gives agentic power to, to, pe to generic name of people in general. We can, we can save uh, our civilization. But in fact, um, because I'm mostly using Swingedown and and Kaika for this, uh, they, they clearly clearly uh, showed that uh, this is a way to, to actually secure capital's hold on, on life and is deeply de depoliticizing uh, the notion that offstage is political possibility. Uh, Swingedown has this uh, very interesting way to talk about uh, Anthropocene as a, as a fantasy, of geopolitical fantasy, um, uh, that it sells itself very well if only we, write, we find the right technology, the, the smartest city, the, the greatest uh, design, the greenest design, we will all live uh, happily ever after. So uh, what is uh, hiding, uh, Stefania already mentioned what is, uh, what is uh, not there in the Anthropocene uh, scientific discussion is uh, not only the inequalities uh, that are, that are uh, uh, at stake, but also the fact that, uh, as Fingered, I would say, uh, it treats ecological concern as some sort of given, like we are all enlightened now, we are smarter, we are realized, and, and this is given uh, compared to the past, or compared, I mean, and think about it, compared to the past, no, like peasants are some kind of past also, that they are included in those uneducated, primitive, some sort of so it's, it's tricky, it, it gives us something to be happy about, we are all more enlightened, but at the same time, not all of us, yeah, it's, uh, it's always not all of us. And uh, certainly, as uh, Swingedow said, is it disregards the conflicts that ha actually have been uh, driving the ecological concerns, just like I said. So it, it's always uh, uh, that uh, these, um, let's say, enlightened concerns come out of conflicts that somebody uh, uh, wishes to, to uh, hide, no? Um, and um, what I like about also the approach of Swingedown, and I didn't hear in, uh, in what, I, what I could understand 
from your presentation before is that he's also putting in the same uh, category of uh, tendency to sort of be optimistic about uh, the new era, let's say. He also puts, uh, uh, let's say, post-capitalist politics because we do tend to, to think that a solution out of this uh, mono, mo, mm, uh, monogamous uh, kind of uh, <laughs> relation with anthropocene, uh, we put uh, too much emphasis precisely on if only we become more horizontal, more heterogeneous, more multi-species uh, kind of uh, um, uh, super reflective and super uh, uh, concerned with, we can transform, terraform the earth in a mutually benign co-constitution. Co co and he says that this is also a bit of a strategic containment in which uh, these immanent ontologies of uh, earth changes uh, um, tend to, to forget again what uh, what he sees as uh, uh, the, the, the uh, the problem of the political, no? I mean, Swinger is obsessed about the political and who isn't here? I think we are all obsessed about the political. And I, and I do tend to favor his approach of the political in the sense that um, he says that whenever we, we come with these symmetrical ontologies, either of geosciences <coughs> or post-human theories, we forget that um, um, by doing that, we are sort of simultaneously saying that subjects are, are, are powerless or uh, powerful, um, both inside and outside. Uh, and, and this is a sort of a playing with empty signifier. No, Anthropocene, just like sustainability, is an empty signifier that is both, uh, can be both inside and outside. And it's, um, and it, it's sort of an a, a obsession or, if you want, a, a desire to, to become constructivist, to, to become radically materialist and to bring something new to the earth and to, to sustain somehow at least some part of the civilization, no? <laughs> to sustain ourselves. If only we can find maybe the right man, the right revolutionary, the right uh, combination of, uh, of uh, species and multi-species and the right love and the right relations and so on and so forth. What I like about Sineda is precisely that he says whatever relational order we end up with, no matter how good or uh, 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 fantastic uh, uh, emancipatory it is, um, we forget that in any relational form uh, we, we have something in excess. There is always that something is left out. What do you do with this excessive part that is somehow left out of any relational order? And for him this is the political. This is where another conflict will always arise. Um, uh, and so somehow, if you, I mean he says that if we want to politicize um, the Anthropocene or uh, whatever the discussion about socio-ecological transformation, we should, as political theories, you know, uh, we should always look at what is potentially left out, what is potentially excessive, super, super numerary, interrupting um, uh, this um, new relational order. He says that um, um, Humans will always continue to act strange, unaccounted for excessively, uh, even to some sort of new way of resilient management or, or that maybe eco-modernizers or whoever. And this uh, whimsical acting, in this whimsical acting, which is very much unpredictable um, and, and can, should be uh, you should be very careful about whether you are celebratory or not, in this uh, acting, uh, we still have to take sides and we still have to make choices. And that's where the, polit the, the political difficulty and, and if you want the political uh, impossibility of utopia is also. This doesn't mean that you should not uh, look at some sort of utopia or ideal, but, but it's always uh, um, uh, kind of a, a difficult moment. Uh, he also calls it the difficult uh, moment of the performative, because performative is not just something that you perform the ideal of equality or, or, or agroecology or justice. The performative is precisely that you are reproducing both an order that, that existed and even in the attempt to transform it, you, re you reproduce it. One of the things that I, came, I, I was thinking about when you were talking about the master, uh, is that when I, when I look at this, uh, let's say, new organization of peasants, what really stands out uh, uh, already 
is this uh, clash uh, within this, let's say, movement that we can celebrate. You know, we, we rightly want to not only not to romanticize. I mean, it's good to romanticize. We are degrowthers. We like to romanticize, but it's this encounter between between the the master and the slave within the alternative, within the movement, the the encounter. The, the clash and the political moment on conflict, for example, within uh, the people who are put together by similar enemy, let's say, they are together because they have a, a common enemy, but in the end they, they, they are not homogenous, they cannot be, especially because we are talking about different generations. We have traditional, old-fashioned kind of peasants who find themselves uh, lonely in the rural areas that are abandoned, and we have few, not too many, but few back to lander younger generation who are more educated in doing permaculture and so on and so forth, and they clash, and they, it's, this moment of encounter between these generations is fantastic to observe. Um, the researchers that I work with in Romania, Andrea Ogrezanu, who is not here, but she's here, um, she was saying to me that um, in these meetings, in these forums where they are continuously trying to renegotiate their uh, voices and their, their way of uh, acting together, let's say, um, then you have uh, this even funny moment, but not only funny, they can also be very violent, of saying, uh, I am here because I want to defend the holy family, and the, the other one is saying, I am here because I don't have any family, and I don't know what family is. So it's <laughs> kind of, it, it very intimate kind of, uh, of having to put themselves together in a new, uh, in what is an emergent movement or not. Uh, I, I'm not even sure if I can call this a new movement. So this is the excess. I mean, this is the political moment because we are not here talking about a specific kind of group. This is, again, I am tempted to think that, pe I, I'm not going to talk about peasants as if it's some sort of clear minority. One of the, there are two reasons why I'm not going to look at the peasants as a clear, homogeneous, um, uh, group of people. One is because the discussion is already either as present as some sort of uh, leftovers that will disappear. The desire is to clearly invisibilize them. It, uh, I mean, this is the, the clear structural move. But the other thing is that um, the, there is also this tendency to, to call for some sort of authenticity. No, 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 we are not disappearing. We are many and we know exactly who we are. We are this conservative, very strong, very, um, we want to defend our nation, we are many, we have our traditions, we, we want to reclaim, let's say, the nation, which is also a very violent kind of uh, new, new populist uh, discourse that is emerging. So you have both these uh, ways of, um, if you want to, to discuss critically uh, the, the concept of peasant itself as a group, because it's not actually the, the fact is it's not a, a homogeneous uh, group. Uh, so one of the things that I, I wanted to show for my um, one of the struggles of this organization is precisely. I mean, besides the typical kind of uh, declaration of rights, and, and this is like also another theme of discussion, um, one of the struggles of, of this organization, let's say, is precisely how to put together such different generations and different, uh, let's say, people uh, into a movement that is, uh, seems to be so necessary on both sides of the political spectrum on the right and on the left. Again, it's about problematizing ideals, political ideas that can be easily co-opted on both sides and can easily become um, ultranationalist, let's say. Mm -hmm. So what to do with this uh, type of solidarity, <laughs> if you want, in the context of land grabbing also. Um, and what to do with the fact that, uh, again, it's a, a present substance. This is still like, I may, it may be my bias, but again, it comes out of exactly the research that Andrea is uh, mostly doing, that uh, presence are, are a presence that is not desired as a present on the one hand, that is a work that is not uh, even considered the work, like Stefania uh, uh, nicely puts it, is not uh, uh, recognized as a work. And um, 
in the same time celebrate their networking, let's say, potential to, to save the seeds. This is about life, reproduction, and so on and so forth. They are doing the work of uh, saving the seeds and they have been growing from a few hundreds uh, ten years ago to more than uh, 10,000 people. I think in the latest number apparently is 12,000, which is <coughs> quite, a, quite a success, I would say. Um, and uh, what the, the, another thing that is in connection with this, let's say, what is this identity group of a peasant and who represents it or who, how do we represent this group that is already not, uh, not so uh, easy to, to talk about. Uh, and another thing, uh, one way to look at it is precisely through the illegality. What I liked uh, that came out of the interview is their illegality. Um, this is how you distinguish, let's say, one, uh, the, the, the farmers, the new, new farmers that maybe take advantage of the, bureaucracy, the European bureaucracy and the new farmers and the new backlanders or even, and uh, those, uh, let's say, a majority that are juggling at the limits of legality when they are doing the seed uh, reproduction and the, and the seed sharing uh, pro networking process. Um, <clears throat> Basically, the, the, the tension here is whether to become legal or not, and which I find it very interesting that they stay in this tension. One of the reasons why they prefer to stay in this tension is because it's so expensive to be legal, <laughs> and this is so uh, incredibly um, you know, telling. It's expensive to be legal. Um, and the other thing um, I would say is because they found in this organization um, a sort of a, a different community. It is fine to maybe not be legal at all and to create a different community, uh, even if it's a bit of a niche, of course, because it has to do also with creating a different market, if you want, a niche market. But I wouldn't say that it's so much about the organic or the... Or the um, you know the new kind of ecological <coughs> markets. So it's still at the at the illegality kind of uh, um, threshold. Um, and another thing that, of course, I'm not, I'm not going to discuss all, all, everything that I wanted to discuss. But um, another quote that made me think uh, a lot uh, was precisely the fact that uh, the condition of poverty, which of course is cash poverty is what helps, in effect, uh, uh, this uh, group uh, of, of uh, peasants and new peasants to stay, um, to stay uh, su sustainable, not to eat healthy and to uh, stay uh, at the small kind of uh, farm level. Uh, and this is something to think about. Of course, we've always uh, uh, talked about how these conflicts are problematizing precisely the concept of well-being and wealth and, and uh, creation of, uh, of wealth. Um, and um, uh, it's also a way to, to encourage what I, what I want to do, which is precisely problematize uh, what is a peasant. Uh, this is, would probably be my, my main move is because uh, I want to look at, at, the, at the peasant or, or the emerging, the becoming of new peasant, if you want, um, not only in the celebratory way, but also precisely at the tension of what is left out uh, in this process of creating a new movement. Uh, I don't want to take this as a simple minority that is, of course, yeah, this is the first move. I'm, a, I'm talking about social environmental justice, and the, the first move is to see that they are a group of poor people. But my, my, tempten, my ten, temptation here is precisely to not go into this minority rights, uh, again, uh, uh, discourse, which is very much uh, um, a way to also co-opt a lot of the NGOs to give money for projects and so on and so forth. So I, I want to see to what extent we can talk about um, 
this group of people in a different way, which also means that we have to rethink our own concepts of social and environmental justice, because for most of us, justice is about uh, rights to minorities or rights to certain identities that are very clear cut. So they have to, just like the products that, that the peasants are supposed to certify, we have to certify for our identity. You know, we have to be clear, clearly those a disadvantaged group that is like this and like this and the same shape of a tomato uh, very nicely put uh, to be standardized, no? Um, so in that sense, this goes back, the last phrase, this goes back to, to, to what Swingada was saying, uh, following Badiou, is that we have to create some sort of fidelity to this uh, practical possibility of the coming community, because the community is coming, but the point is not to create it as some sort of ideal, fixed, um, you know, it's already there uh, uh, ideal, uh, and to realize that there is no ultimate ontological guarantee that comes from history or nature or party or state, and that we do not need to le legitimize uh, these uh, forms of becoming on the basis of some ontological uh, Choices. Yeah, the presentation of the Frederick Schemes. Ultrapassing the frontiers of voluntarism and Anthropocene, causes alterations climatic. And the Vera Ferreira, a Mestre in Relations Internationales for the Faculty of Economy at the University of Coimbra, in 2017, is actually an investigator of the Junior Centers of Sociales, where he integrates the equipment of investigation of the Project Tru e proteção no Clube de Estudos sobre Ciência, Economia e Sociedade. Frequenta também doutoramento em alterações climáticas e sofrejamento sustentável no Instituto de Ciências Sociais da Universidade de Lisboa, uh, tendo sido recentemente atribuída a bolsa de doutoramento no âmbito deste programa. Passava então a dar a palavra para a ver a Olá. Bom dia a todas e a todos, bem-vindos mais uma vez, bem-vindas. Uh, eu estou aqui um bocadinho num esforço de interdisciplinaridade. Uh, eu sou originalmente das Ciências Sociais, mas atualmente estou fazendo um bocadinho de Ciências Climáticas e, portanto, a perspectiva que eu gostaria aqui de partilhar convosco hoje, uh, ou seja, eu hoje situo-me mais no meu papel de cientista das alterações climáticas do que propriamente no meu papel de cientista social. Isto porque eu tenho tido uma dificuldade no percurso uh, e também uma certa perplexidade em constatar que nós não dialogamos. Uh, não existe um diálogo entre as ciências sociais e as ciências naturais. Nós encheramos, nós encontramos fechados nas nossas barricadas e eu gostava de vos perguntar uh, quantos engenheiros, biólogos, geólogos, etc. estarão nesta sala? A Rita, ok. Ok. Gustavo, qual é a tua área? What is your Ciência ambiental. Mainfield, ok. Undergraduate, what's my environment and science. Mas a maioria são cientistas sociais, certo? Portanto, eu espero aqui poder-vos ensinar alguma coisinha, um humilde contributo. Uh, através uh, da ciência das alterações climáticas e, e da geologia. Uh, isto porque, uh, retomando um bocadinho o, o, o ponto que o Manuel introduziu uh, na sua apresentação, uh, as categorias do antropoceno são complexas e fascinantes e, de facto, aqui hoje já ouvimos comunicações uh, muito provocadoras, uh, muito estimulantes, que categorizavam o antropoceno exatamente em quanto categoria política, categoria sociológica, categoria histórica, até categoria económica. Eu vou voltar um bocadinho às origens e, portanto, a entender o antropoceno aqui exclusivamente enquanto categoria geológica. Portanto, esse, esse é o meu ponto de partida. Eu olho nesta apresentação e apenas nesta apresentação para o antropoceno enquanto uma unidade no tempo geológico, uma unidade na escala do tempo geológico. Uh, eu acho que é importante porque, quer no debate acerca das alterações climáticas, quer no debate acerca do antropoceno, nós precisamos de interlocução e de tradução entre as nossas áreas de investigação. Considero que nós precisamos de ser poliglotas também na ciência e de partilhar uma certa linguagem, porque se nós constatarmos, e já foi aqui referido anteriormente, de facto o debate das alterações climáticas está completamente dominado, quer por cientistas naturais, quer por economistas. E, portanto, nós precisamos, se nós também não fizermos um esforço de compreender essa linguagem, se nós não fizermos um esforço, 
de integração e de interlocução, continuaremos a ser uh, excluídos desses debates. Uh, e, aliás, temos um exemplo bastante concreto e, e recente aqui em Portugal, que tem a ver com o recente roteiro para a neutralidade carbónica, que foi aprovado em Conselho de Ministros recentemente, aqui em Portugal. E uh, eu tenho-vos a dizer, com conhecimento de causa, que não foram consultados quaisquer cientistas especiais para a elaboração deste roteiro. Portanto, as políticas públicas em Portugal, e este é o meu campo de investigação, portanto, estou mais concentrado no caso português, as políticas públicas em Portugal, no domínio das alterações climáticas, no domínio do ordenamento do território, da agricultura, da floresta, não consultam simplesmente cientistas sociais. E, portanto, uh, este é o meu esforço. É um esforço de tentar ligar aqui os dois mundos. Uh, espero ser bem-sucedida, uh, veremos. Uh, então, uh, o meu objetivo aqui é sistematizar e analisar a trajetória das alterações climáticas no antropoceno. E aqui considerando as alterações climáticas como um sintoma, talvez um dos principais sintomas do antropoceno. Retomaria algumas das coisas que já foram ditas pelo Emanuel. Eu aqui utilizo o enquadramento do antropoceno, tal como referi enquanto época geológica, mas recorro também ao conceito de fronteiras planetárias. Eu agora vou uh, fazer um brevíssimo apanhado destes dois conceitos e depois detalharei, detalharei se tiver tempo um pouquinho melhor à frente. Um, em 2016, o, o Grupo de Trabalho sobre o Antropoceno, que é um grupo ad hoc da Comissão Internacional de Estratigrafia, uh, recomendou que se declarasse uma nova época geológica, uh, este tal Antropoceno. E o Antropoceno reconhece essencialmente duas coisas. Por um lado, que a Terra está a transcender a sua atual época geológica, o Holoceno, e por outro lado, que as atividades humanas uh, seriam as, uh, o principal... Uh, fator para, para esta transgressão. Uh, Stephen e colegas, no artigo de 2011, diziam mesmo que a humanidade se transformou numa força geológica global de pleno direito. Claro que aqui há problemas. Uh, quem é esta humanidade? Quais são estas atividades humanas? Algo que os meus colegas, e muito bem, já problematizaram e desconstruíram anteriormente. Aqui, a humanidade é simplesmente encarada enquanto espécie biológica. Vamos falar de uma espécie, uma espécie humana, e aqui entendida simplesmente enquanto categoria biológica, não enquanto uh, produtora e produtora de desigualdades económicas e sociais. Portanto, este é o grande problema, e em partir da opinião dos meus colegas, é esta visão monolítica, a histórica, uh, do antropoceno. Mas esse não é o debate com que os geólogos estão preocupados neste momento. Eles estão preocupados com o debate da datação e da delimitação do antropoceno que o Emanuel já uh, também uh, aflorou na sua intenção. Uh, e depois há um segundo conceito, de fronteiras planetárias, que surgiu também um bocadinho uh, atrelado ao de antropoceno e que procura uh, enfatizar esta urgência de fazer o sistema terrestre regressar às condições do Holoceno. Para termos um bocadinho de ideia, o nosso planeta tem 4,5 mil milhões de anos. O Holoceno é o pequeníssimo período uh, de, que corresponde aos últimos 11 mil anos. Portanto, foi o período que permitiu à espécie humana uh, sobreviver e florescer e, e desenvolver-se. E, e o que este conceito prevê, ou o seu objetivo principal, é definir e quantificar um espaço operacional seguro para a humanidade, exatamente no que diz respeito ao funcionamento do sistema terrestre. Uh, então, eu vou passar muito brevemente à, à contextualização e emergência do antropoceno. Uh, e o meu objetivo aqui é dar-vos a um bocadinho esta, esta noção de que uh, as atividades humanas são de, facto, de tal forma um, transversais e amplas que de facto um, se pode considerar que a humanidade é uma força geológica claro que qual humanidade onde, sobretudo também são questões que eu não, que eu não tratarei aqui e numa segunda fase passarei a análise da trajetória das alterações climáticas assim só uma, uma questão uh, o que são alterações climáticas? Aqui, recorrendo um bocadinho à, à, ao formato da Irina e espicaçar um bocadinho. What is climate change? Yeah. Warming of the planet and associated with the ecological changes such as uh, sea level rise, uh, the changing atmospheric patterns of El Nino uh, um, and the uh, ecological impacts of this. Uh, 
the changes. Coral reef uh, bleaching, for instance, <coughs> coastal erosion. Que é então o auge da ubris humana, por assim dizer. 
uh, esta ideia de que de alguma forma teríamos poder para controlar o funcionamento do sistema terrestre. A datação do antropoceno tem sido uh, contestada. Uh, o Emanuel já falou há pouco, de facto, que o século XVIII e o início da Revolução Industrial é apontado por vários autores como uma fronteira. Uh, é o momento a partir do qual começamos a assistir a um maior incremento das emissões de gases com efeito de estufa, sobretudo a uh, dióxido de carbono e o metano. Mas temos aqui um ano-chave, temos aqui um momento-chave que é, de facto, a segunda metade do século XX, o uh, um período que os autores designam, então, por grande aceleração. A partir de, de, do final da Segunda Guerra Mundial, as atividades humanas, ou atividade, as atividades de alguns humanos, uh, começaram a... Uh, a dominar o ambiente global em muitas vertentes. Deixaram de o influenciar para passar a dominá-lo em muitas vertentes. Eu vou-vos mostrar rapidamente aqueles que são conhecidos como os gráficos da grande aceleração. Estes gráficos uh, são dois conjuntos de gráficos. Este primeiro conjunto diz respeito às tendências socioeconómicas entre 1750 e 2010. Este segundo conjunto diz respeito às tendências do sistema terrestre nesse mesmo período. E o que é importante? E o que é interessante e importante constatar é que, neste primeiro conjunto de gráficos, a partir de 1950, eu não sei se vocês veem bem, mas ali a partir, onde está aquele tracejado, a partir de 1950, há uma explosão de vários indicadores. A população do PIB, a nível mundial, e da população urbana em particular, assiste também ao aumento do consumo de energia, de fertilizantes, não por acaso, de água, de transportes, etc. Concomitantemente, vemos uma disrupção no sistema terrestre. Portanto, quando existe essa tal explosão do empreendimento humano, como lhe chama o autor, há uma clara disrupção no sistema terrestre, que é medida quer pelas concentrações de gases com efeito de estufa, de óxido de carbono, óxido nitroso, metano, mas também pelo aumento da temperatura, pela disrupção do ozono estratosférico. Ou seja, há uma simultaneidade daquelas que são as tendências socioeconómicas e as tendências do sistema terrestre neste período. Daí que muitos autores se refiram a esta época não como antropoceno, mas efetivamente como capital oceano. Ah, não querendo perder demasiado tempo aqui na questão da adaptação, já tenho zero tempo. Sim, minuto? Ok. Ah, há, aqui um, há aqui um dado muito curioso, que tem a ver com a proposta de Zalazevich, que é geólogo, e é um dos principais proponentes da designação uh, do Antropoceno. Uh, ele uh, usa aqui a experiência de Trinity, isto é, a prim primeiro teste de explosão uh, nuclear, como fronteira para o início do Antropoceno. E por dois motivos em particular, não só porque um, a bomba atómica um, reiterou este domínio da espécie humana sobre o planeta, nós somos provavelmente a única espécie que tem capacidade de extinguir-se a si própria e distinguir todas as outras espécies, Uh, que é no mínimo parvo. Uh, de facto, somos as únicas peças que têm esta, esta coisa de destruição em massa. Ou seja, uh, isso diz muito da nossa UBRIS também. Uh, não só por isso, mas também porque existe uma marca física e existe uma marca nos estratos e é essa a marca que vai permitir ou não aos geólogos definir que efetivamente entramos numa nova época geológica. É aquilo que eles designam por Golden Spike. Portanto, para que haja a entrada de uma nova época geológica, é necessário que haja marcas nos estratos, nas camadas rochosas. É este debate que é menos interessante para nós, mas que vai determinar se na geologia ou não, esta época é considerada, de facto, como uma unidade do tempo geológico. Eu vou passar já para as fronteiras planetárias. Um, não sei se estão familiarizados com este termo. Um, como eu tinha dito no início, o objetivo das fronteiras planetárias é estabelecer limites. Também estes limites que nos pretendem dar uma noção de controle sobre o sistema terrestre. não por acaso, uh, estes limites são apontados como limites do sistema terrestre, mas são limites quantificados e criados por nós. Portanto, mais, mais uma vez aqui aquela noção de que somos nós quem controla os limites, somos nós quem os posicionamos. E então, uh, o que Rockstrom e colegas fizeram foi identificar nove processos do sistema terrestre, e os seus tais limiares. Então, a partir do momento em que esses limiares fossem transgredidos, nós corremos o risco de destabilizar completamente as condições do holoceno. E então, esses, essas, essas fronteiras são, são várias, dentro das quais as alterações climáticas, mas temos também 
a significação dos oceanos, a camada do ozono, a poluição, uh, e aquilo que nós vemos aqui, este espacinho verde aqui, que seria o tal espaço uh, seguro para a humanidade. Portanto, enquanto nós estivéssemos dentro daqueles limiares, tudo bem. A partir do momento em que o ultrapassaríamos, como aqui nestes três casos, e como é o caso das alterações climáticas, os efeitos poderiam ser irreversíveis e não havia nada que, à partida, nós conseguimos fazer para os reverter. As alterações climáticas são, então, aqui o meu ponto principal de análise. Uh, o painel intergovernamental para as alterações climáticas, uh, ainda que tenha surgido como um órgão cujo objetivo era ser manipulado politicamente, uh, o IPCC foi criado durante a administração Reagan, que não era conhecida propriamente pela sua vontade em solucionar a crise ambiental e, portanto, este, este órgão um, deveria... O seu objetivo era ser um fantoche, no fundo. Correu-lhes mal. Uh, Correu-lhes mal porque, de facto, o IPCC é certo que tem sido conservador. Uh, no entanto, tem cedido muito pouco a pressões políticas, o que é de louvar. E logo o seu primeiro relatório foi inequívoco ao dizer que uh, havia uma clara interferência das atividades humanas no sistema climático. Claro que não disse quais, de quais humanos, atividades de quais humanos, não, mas existem, de facto, influências antropogénicas no sistema climático, são inegáveis. E a partir daí que nós temos vindo a assistir é, à mudança na, nas propriedades de vários indicadores do sistema climático. Provavelmente o mais evidente é o aquecimento da atmosfera dos oceanos. Uh, só para termos a noção, 17 dos 18 anos mais quentes desde que existe registro ocorreram desde 2000. Isto num registro que diz respeito a 136 anos. 2016 foi o ano mais quente desde que existem registros. Num relatório recente, uh, o IPCC diz-nos que as atividades humanas foram responsáveis por cerca de 1 grau de Celsius de aquecimento global acima dos níveis pré-industriais. Uh, isto é, é muitíssimo importante. Os oceanos acumularam 90% da energia, acumulada, acumularam, okay, 90 da energia uh, que existe no sistema climático entre 71 e 2010. Portanto, se não existissem oceanos, okay, se não existissem oceanos, we were doomed. Sim, os oceanos são o que nos salvam neste momento, uh, quer por absorverem energia, quer por absorverem o dióxido de carbono. E, portanto, o que é que é preciso ter aqui em consideração? Uh, a trajetória do sistema de redes está a aproximar-se muito rapidamente do tal, do tal limiar planetário. Uh, se esse limiar for ultrapassado, uh, é possível que nós enverdemos por um caminho de diversibilidade e em que não só serão condições muito mais quentes e inóspitas para nós seres humanos, como também serão condições profundamente inóspitas para outras espécies. Um, portanto, nós seríamos não só responsáveis pela, pela nossa própria morte, como também da morte de, de outras espécies. Um, e, portanto, aquilo que vários autores defendem é que temos a trajetória para uma stabilized earth, uma terra estabilizada. E tenhamos em consideração que a humanidade é uma componente integral e atuante do sistema terrestre. Não só o sistema terrestre tem uh, uma vida própria, que não depende de nós, Uh, mas nós também somos um, um fator fundamental no funcionamento do sistema. E, e é essa a visão que eu quero deixar. Temos que ver a Terra, a Gaia, como algo integrado, em que nós somos apenas um ínfimo ator, um de muitos atores. Uh, e é isso. Obrigada.